Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gloria and I'm from Mitchell Society um, the Education Committee. So basically today we are here to listen, to learn more about co-living with Singapore's common palm civet. And um, I'll just introduce the speaker. She's a uh, <clears throat> Uh, Ms. Fang Zikuan. So Zikuan is an ecologist and a member of NSS Vertebrate Study Group. Okay, she has been involved in the research and conservation of the common palm civet since 2010. Uh, that's when I first met her. Uh, we were in a walk at Sikla. Okay, so Zikuan is actually a, currently a PhD student at the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. And her, her research focuses on plant-animal interactions, specifically on linking seed dispersal ecology to forest restoration. Uh, for biodiversity conservation and climate change mitigation in Southeast Asia. Okay, so she's a member of IUCN uh, Small Carnivore Specialist Group, Urban Wildlife Working Group, and NUS Body Cats. So she enjoys mammal watching and poop hunting in forests. So you'll learn more why she likes to hunt for poop. Okay, so I'll pass the time over to Zhuguang. Um, if you have questions, please type it into the chat group. And uh, also please stay muted throughout the talk. Okay. Um, we, because that will be very disruptive if you keep interrupting. So we'll put all questions to the end. Um, okay, so Zukran, please. Yep. Thank you, Gloria. You're welcome. Let me share my screen yeah. now. Yep. Can everyone see the full screen? Yeah, I can see. Okay. Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us on the Saturday uh, afternoon. And thanks, Gloria and Ding Li, for inviting me to share more about the common palm civets. Um, so today, uh, my sharing will be about co-living with the common palm civets in Singapore. So what is a civet? Um, the common palm civet um, is a small to medium-sized mammal. Uh, like other mammals, it has fur, give birth to young alive, and they produce milk. Um, it is from the order carnivora. So this group of animals, they have uh, premolars and molars that are modified into blade-like teeth, which allows them to cut like flesh effectively. And we call this group of animals uh, carnivorans. The common palm civet, or other civets are also members of the family Viveridae, and this group of animals tend to have stripes, spots, uh, and or rings on their body and tails. They also have um, relatively long snout, uh, long tails, and short legs. So civets are also found in Asia and Africa. Uh, people tend to call them civet cats or toddy cats, but they are actually not cats, nor weasel or raccoons, but they are also actually more closely related to mongooses and hyenas. So in the past, um, there are nine species of civets that have been recorded in Singapore. Uh, this also includes the binturong, the large spotted civet. However, due to urbanization and deforestation uh, resulting from loss of habitat, uh, currently we only have four civets, four species of civets. And they are the small tooth palm civet, which is relatively rare, and their distribution restricted to our nature reserve, which is the CCNR, the Central Nature Catchment uh, Nature Reserve, the Bukitima Nature Reserve. Uh, we also have the Malay civet, uh, where the last sighting of an individual was in 2012, and also the large Indian civet, where the last confirmed record was in 1990s. So if you are interested to learn more about the threatened plants and animals of Singapore, you can also refer to the Singapore Red Data Book. And of course, uh, the last civet species that we have uh, is the common palm civet, which has been able to adapt to the urban areas and forested areas in Singapore. So what makes the common palm civet so special is that they are one of our last wild native urban carnivorans. Um, the other being the smooth-coated otters that you might have seen in, say, Amokyo Bishan Park. Um, so how do we know this is a common palm civet? So you can recognize this animal by its black facial mask across the eyes, uh, the tail, which is as long as their body, uh, the spots that's on the side of the body, as well as the dorsal area, as well as their relatively short legs. So the common palm civet as a species has been a uh, little studied in Singapore and the Southeast Asia region, uh, especially back in the early 2000s. Uh, we started studying this species in 2009 as a result of a series of human civet interaction cases. Um, we realized that we do not actually know much about this species, despite them sharing the urban space with us. So together as a team with uh, 
my senior, Ms. Shi Weiting, who actually started uh, the first civil study as an honor student with uh, Mr. Siva Soti. Um, and uh, we have been since conducting a series of research and student projects at NUS uh, to better understand these species. So this includes uh, their biology, the diet, the plants that they fit on, their ecological role, as well as uh, people's perception and awareness towards these species. So how has the civet managed to survive urbanization and how, where can we find them in Singapore? Um, this is a map of Singapore showing where civet species have been recorded. Um, the round circles uh, represent sightings of the common palm civet. Um, so if you look at the map and analyze the, the little uh, icons on the map, you can find that uh, the common palm civets are actually the most widely distributed and most common species of civet in Singapore. The four other various species of civets uh, were also recorded. Uh, that includes the nationally critically endangered small tooth palm civet that I mentioned earlier. So you can see um, that's represented by the triangles, which uh, is restricted to CTNR and BTNR. Um, so as you can see from the map, the common palm civet is the only civet that is present in both forested areas and urban areas in Singapore. Um, in urban areas, they are commonly sighted at Sick Club uh, and Potsdam area. And they can also be found in uh, Pulau Ubin, which is an offshore island. So how do we study civets or how do we observe them in order to take a peek into their secret lives? Uh, we mainly use two methods. The first is uh, spot lighting. So spot lighting also means uh, the use of torch lights to detect the eye shine of these animals. So uh, when you shine a torch light at the animal, the, the light will reflect from their eyes. Um, different mammals have different color eye shines. Uh, so for the common palm civet is uh, usually orange in color. Um, for camera trapping, uh, we also use uh, camera traps, which is a battery operated uh, camera with heat and motion sensor. So uh, the camera trap will be triggered to take a photo when it detects heat and movement, such as when an animal or when uh, one of us walk past it. So in a forest, uh, we usually secure the camera uh, onto a tree at the height of the animal about maybe half a meter above ground and leave it there to take any uh, photos of the animals. So it's a generally a uh, non-invasive method uh, where you just leave the camera there and you know the animals are usually not disturbed by it. Um, however, in urban areas, uh, sometimes we have to be a little bit more creative in order to capture activities of civets because of the unique uh, urban matrix. So on the left, you can see that's uh, waiting an eye uh, climbing onto a ladder uh, to actually uh, attach and deploy the camera trap on a tree so that we could capture some activities of uh, civets on the roof. And so the usually the, the camera trap would uh, be able to last, the batteries will be able to last about uh, four weeks. And so after that, we will just uh, visit the camera again. We'll retrieve the photos uh, which are stored in an SD card and replace the batteries. So there's also another way of detecting the civets, which is a uh, link to a fun fact. So they smell like pandan. So if you are out for an evening stroll in your neighborhood park and you get a whiff of pandan, but you didn't see any pandan plant around, you may have a civet peering at you from the above. Yep. So within these areas, uh, where do civets live and what are their habitats? So civets are great climbers. They have a predominantly uh, arboreal lifestyle. Uh, and in terms of habitat use, uh, they are actually still largely dependent on the neighboring forest patches in the urban matrix. Um, but they are also able to use structures in the urban landscape, such as uh, you can see them uh, sometimes using the roof, uh, resting on the, in the roof space, uh, in the dense vegetation of trees, uh, or even uh, on the space uh, above the aircon. Moving about, um, civets are also usually uh, observed to use tree canopies uh, in their natural uh, wild environment. So greenery makes a very important ecological connectivity in the urban space. Um, so why do I say it's important? Because this arboreal connectivity minimizes the threats that civets may face when they have to come down to the ground to cross these gaps. So uh, from our camera traps and observations, we have also found that uh, civets use structures uh, in the urban areas such as power lines, uh, fences, or even drains in the neighborhood. 
And so from the photos that I've shown you so far, can you guess like when civets are active? Um, so yep, they are active at night. Um, so from the year-long camera trapping that we have conducted um, in the urban area, uh, we found that civets are nocturnal crepuscular. So for every camera trap photo, there is a timestamp on the top left-hand corner of the photo. So this gives us the date and the time where the camera was triggered. Uh, and of course, we would know where the civet was sighted because that, that would be where we have deployed the camera traps. So uh, civets are nocturnal crepuscular. Uh, so this means that they are active at night and they have uh, two main peaks, two main uh, activity peaks. So they are most active uh, between uh, about 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. and also 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. So camera traps can also tell us more about the animal's behavior and their reproduction uh, biology. Uh, we found that civets are usually solitary. So this means that um, they are usually uh, moving around on their own. Um, but this is with exception when the females have young. So we have also observed females with typically one to two babies. Uh, but we have also seen up to uh, four babies uh, from one female. So sometimes uh, we can also tell the sex of the animal from the camera traps. So from the left, uh, it is a male, as you can see uh, from the facial features and, uh, and the genitals. And then as well as for the right, uh, that's the female with uh, its juvenile. And so now we know uh, when they're active and where they live, uh, we want to know what they eat. Um, but civets are nocturnal, uh, we know that they are active at night, they are quite shy and elusive, so this makes them uh, really difficult to observe, um, especially in forests or areas with dense vegetation. Um, so sometimes when the civet could be right in front of you, uh, but you can't really spot them. So how do we study diet? Um, so what goes in will come out, right? So uh, we look at, we study their diet by looking through their poop or what we call scats. Um, but we also have another problem, uh, which is a question that I get very frequently, which is, how do you know this is a civet poop? How, how, do, how, how, how do you identify a civet poop? So um, make a guess, um, which of these six photos uh, consists of a civet scat? I'm sure you got the answer. <laughs> uh, actually, all of them are civet scats. So the civet scats can look different according to the fruits that they feed on, but we can generally uh, identify them through the location, the size, and the presence of civet hair, which they ingest accidentally when they groom themselves. So civets are carnivorans, so they tend to defecate at open areas. So in the middle of the trail, on the roof, uh, as well as sometimes uh, they may defecate on large rocks. So civet poop are also uh, relatively uh, large, I would say, um, that range between five, uh, 10 to 15 cm long. So for my research, uh, I've dedicated like several years uh, searching for civet poop. Uh, I have to go where civets go to. Uh, so this includes uh, surveying the forest trails, visiting mangrove boardwalks, and even climbing rooftops, although I have, um, I'm really scared of height. Uh, but in order to collect the civet poop, I have to overcome my fears. So um, in general, uh, um, residents are also really happy to have me climbing their roof because uh, they get their roof cleaned in return. So um, surveys can be really long uh, because for example, uh, during uh, my surveys, that I conduct on Pulau Ubin, we will have to cycle um, 7 to 10 km on the island. And so that can sometimes be really long and tiring. So when uh, my volunteers and I come across like really fresh and pretty pile of silver poop, uh, we can't resist but to take selfies with it. So you can see from our very happy faces that you know it's really enjoyable to be able to find uh, the silver poop uh, during your surveys. So if you see the photo on the left, right, so uh, that was a really great memory because um, after four years of collecting silver poop, that was the first time that I have found two piles of silver poop uh, side by side each other. Yeah, so um, after collecting the civet poop, uh, the scats were brought back to uh, the lab for preservation. 
And the diet items were sorted according to morphological similarities and identified to the lowest taxonomy level. So basically, uh, I'll wash the civet poop um, and then I'll preserve them in ethanol. And then when, I'm, uh, when it's ready for sorting, I will uh, bring them out and then put them uh, in the white tray so that I can see uh, the items uh, from the civet poop. Um, so to date, I have uh, collected more than 700 civet skets and the collection uh, is now deposited in the Likong Chen Natural History Museum. And so um, what did I find from sorting all of this civet poop? I found that the civets are highly frugivorous. This means that they feed on a lot of fruits. Uh, more than 60% of their diet consists of fruits. And I recorded at least 41 species of fruits and counted more than 26,000 seeds from these skets. So today, uh, I will be sharing with you uh, six main plant species that I have found the civets to feed on. And these plants can be found in our forest. At the top of the list is the fishtail palm. Um, so this is the most likely type of civet sket that you will encounter in both the forest and in the urban areas. And you can easily recognize them because uh, they look like a pile of blueberries. Yeah. So um, the fishtail palm karata mites uh, is the dominant food plant species. And coincidentally, like the common palm civet, um, it is a palm species that is relatively common, but um, not very well studied. You can see these um, species at the edge of our forest and recognize them uh, by the shape of the leaflet, uh, which looks like fishtail. So the fishtail palm uh, fruits year round, and therefore uh, it could potentially be an important uh, species that can provide stable food sources for our wildlife. Um, so the fruits uh, actually contain oxalate acid. So uh, please do not touch the fruits with your bare hands because it's really painful when you come, come in contact with it. The second plant species is the false olive Champeri melinana. So uh, you may find this name familiar if you uh, like to go to MacRitchie for trekking. Um, so this is because the Champeri trail is named after this species. Um, unlike the fishtail palm, the false olive does not fruit year round. Um, if you remember, there was a dry spell in early 2014, uh, which resulted in a mass fruiting episode uh, of the false olive. So um, that was between about March to May. And uh, to my surprise, the civets on Pulau Ubin switched their main diet from the fishtail palm to this species. And why did I remember this so vividly? Um, is because I collected a record breaking of 35 poop samples from one single field trip. Yeah, so um, next up we have um, the next plant species, which is the Ericebe tomentosa. Um, the Ericebe tomentosa is a woody climber. So the species name tomentosa uh, in Latin means that it's covered with uh, dense hair. So it means that this plant has, uh, is, is quite hairy. Um, and like the false olive, uh, it also has seasonality in fruit availab availability. And now it's actually kind of the, the, the fruiting season. So uh, the sightings of this type of uh, this civet poop with this plant species uh, have also been seen at uh, areas such as the Chestnut Nature Park. So if you are out uh, hiking at Chestnut Nature Park, you could maybe look, keep a lookout for this civet poop. Um, so the fourth plant species um, is the sea short nutmeg, uh, Nima globularia. So this is an interesting one because um, the sea short nutmeg is a critically endangered uh, native tree species in Singapore. Uh, the seeds are also relatively large at 15 mm and I found that uh, the seeds are able to germinate. Uh, and this species is actually considered quite rare on mainland Singapore, but not so on Pulau Ubin. So it has been thought that, you know, maybe the civil population may have contributed to the persistence of this plant species on the island. Civets also feed on figs, uh, such as the climbing fig, uh, Ficus pangtata. So fruits of the climbing figs are orange in color and about the size of a tennis ball when it's ripe. Um, you can easily see this uh, fruit and plant along the southern ridges. Um, and besides the climbing fig, uh, I've also observed civets to feed on other ficus species, such as the common red stem fig. 
So figs in general uh, have been recorded in other diet studies of uh, common palm civets in the region as well. And as a fruit that is available year-round, uh, figs are also known as keystone species, which where they can provide an important food source for many other fruit-eating animals like the bats, birds, and primates. And lastly, we have tembusu. Um, this is the tree species uh, where we have uh, the photo at the back of our $5 note. And this is one of my favorite civet photos uh, of a common palm civet uh, spotted at NUS at 3 a.m. Uh, thanks to Brian who shared with us his sighting. Um, so the civet also fit on this species between August to January when the tembusu fruits. Um, the fruits of this uh, plant are small and orange in color and supposedly they taste bitter. Um, and these ripe fruits are also eaten by uh, bats and birds. So in urban areas, uh, the civets tend to eat a slightly different uh, plant species. So we have observed uh, civets to uh, feed on commonly planted uh, street trees, uh, including that of the rain trees. And the rain trees are the umbrella-shaped trees that we see very common by the roadside. And civets like us uh, also like to eat sweet and juicy fruits. Um, so uh, they have been spotted in gardens, feeding on rambutans, uh, chiku, uh, mango, and also fruits like banana. So if you like wildlife watching uh, from the comfort of your home, uh, these are some of the fruit trees that you can consider planting in your garden. And besides fruits, uh, we also found that civets also feed on animal prey. Um, they are omnivorous. So from sorting through the civet species, uh, I found exoskeletons of insects, such as crickets and grasshoppers. Uh, I've also found furs and bones of rodents, feathers from birds, as well as uh, mangrove crabs, uh, where the civet species were collected from the mangroves. Um, so this wide variety of food resources that they are able to utilize uh, is probably one of the reasons for their adaptability uh, in both the forest and uh, urban areas. So given their, you know, they, they feed on a lot of fruits, what do you think is their role in the ecosystem? Here's a hint. They are seed dispersals. So what is seed dispersal and why is it important? So um, seed dispersal is one of the key phases in plant reproduction. And therefore this ecological process is um, vital for maintaining plant diversity and regeneration of forests. So um, we have learned in school that there are different modes of seed dispersal. There's like wind dispersal, water dispersal, um, and of course there's also animal mediated uh, seed dispersal. So in tropical forests, um, this plant-animal interaction is the predominant form of dispersal where about 90% of the plant species are dispersed by animals. And so this brings me to the next part of my sharing, which is on understanding the ecological role of the common palm civet um, as a seed dispersal. So one very important question to ask is, um, how effective is the common palm civet as a seed dispersal? But first, we need to know what is an effective seed dispersal. So there are three main points. Uh, the first is uh, diversity. So an effective seed dispersal has to eat fruits, ideally from a wide diversity of fruit, uh, plant species. This is so that they can disperse seeds of a range of different traits, such as seed size or, concept or um, habits. And then there's also quantity. So this means that the animal should ideally swallow the seeds and disperse a large number of them. And number three, quality. So these seeds should be viable and able to germinate to grow into seedlings. And their gut passage uh, should have a positive or neutral effect on seed germination. And lastly, they should be able to uh, disperse the seeds far away from their parent plant. And so from the previous sharing, we know that civets are highly frugivorous, they eat a lot of fruits. Um, but what are some of the characteristics and the traits of these food plant species? So from the conservation status of the plant species, uh, I found that the civets feed on mostly common species like the fishtail palm and the tembusu. 
but perhaps more relevant to the conservation of plants, civets also consume rarer species. So for example, on the right, on the left, we have the Tensteri radii, which is a native climber of a local vulnerable status. And on the right, we have the Centaur, which is a native tree species, which is um, endangered. Um, I also look into the seed size. Um, so seed size is important because large seeded plants are often dependent on large body fruit eating animals. Um, and, but however, these large body frugivores are usually also the most vulnerable to habitat loss. And so in Singapore, we have actually lost uh, our large body frugivores. And so could the common palm civets be the ones that are providing this uh, seed dispersal service? And so what I found is that um, the, civet, the seeds that are defecated by the civets were found to range from as small as 1 mm, uh, which are the seeds of the climbing fig, to a maximum length of 31 mm, which is that of the rambutan. So this is also the largest uh, seed size uh, documented to be ingested by a common palm civet. And so now we know that civets are not only highly frugivorous, but they can also disperse seeds of a wide range of physical traits. And not only that, um, civets, uh, the seeds defecated by the civets were also viable. And this means that the seeds are able to germinate into seedlings. Uh, we found that the gut passage uh, can enhance the germination rate and viability of these ingested seeds. And so this means that when the civets eat the fruit and the seeds, uh, the, the, the act of the seeds passing through the gut passage of the uh, civet and defecating, being defecating out, uh, this actually improve uh, the chances of the seeds germinating. And so in particular, the false olive um, benefits the most from passing through the gut passage, where I've observed the percentage of germination uh, being increased significantly. And so germination percentage for fishtail palm uh, and other plants such as the noni uh, can be as high as 93%. And uh, other plants that were also found to be viable includes the Zyzygium mitifolium, Nima globularia, and the Castori radii. And so um, finally, to find out how far civets can disperse seeds, um, I also uh, monitored the movement patterns of six wild civets using GPS telemetry. Um, so GPS telemetry or the GPS collar is a technology and equipment that we deploy on the animal, uh, which allows us to monitor the movement and the home range of uh, the individual. So this data, together with the findings from the gut passage time, uh, allowed me to estimate the seed dispersal distance of up to 1.3 kilometers. And so taking all of this information together, we now know that uh, civets are indeed uh, effective seed dispersals. They are highly frugivorous. Their diet consists of a wide diversity of plant species um, and also a range of seed traits. Um, they also feed on, um, they also sweet, feed and swallow seeds intact and are able to disperse many seeds in their poo. Uh, these seeds are intact, they are viable and are able to germinate and also their gut passage improve the germination uh, percentage of these plants. And lastly, uh, the civets are able to disperse seeds far away from the plant parent plant uh, of, uh, of a maximum distance of 1.3 kilometers. And so the common palm civet, uh, which is a common yet neglected species, uh, could potentially be an important link to the recovery of the forest fragments in urban Singapore and even degraded landscapes in the Southeast Asia region. However, um, there's still much more for us to uncover and understand about these plant-animal interactions and their implications on forest succession and regeneration, both uh, locally and regionally. So this includes other interactions such as uh, seed predation and pollination that we also still do not know much about. Um, and we are also still recording new plant species that the civets feed on. And uh, what was very exciting was that very recently, uh, we observed the rare small tooth palm civet uh, to be feeding on the same tree as the common palm civet uh, on a fruiting palocom ovovatum. So this just shows how much more that we need to study about uh, the 
civets in Singapore, the other fruit-eating animals in Singapore, as well as um, other seed dispersals. And so um, in a time where we are facing uh, two major global crises, which is biodiversity loss and climate change, perhaps uh, an understanding on the role of wildlife and species interactions, which are key to self-sustaining and resilient ecosystems become increasingly important. So you may have heard about nature-based climate solutions, so which is a, quite a commonly used term now. So these include the conservation, restoration, and improved management of forests, uh, wetlands, and agricultural lands to increase carbon sequestration, uh, reduce carbon dioxide emissions, and to enhance climate uh, resilience. So scientists have also increasingly emphasized on the urgency to address these two crises together through these solutions by placing biodiversity at the heart of the solution. Um, so moving forward, um, it will be really important to understand um, how seed sources, seed dispersals, and, you know, the, and how these can imp have implications on forest succession and regeneration. And of course, then this actually leads to my current uh, PhD research with the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, where I'm actually focusing on understanding the importance of biodiversity for climate change mitigation. And I'm going to end by focusing on how to link seed dispersal ecology to forest re restoration, biodiversity conservation, and climate change mitigation. And so now we have some understanding of the ecology of our native wildlife, of our civets and their interactions with our forests. Um, how can this knowledge be applied to biodiversity conservation? Or why should we conserve a common species like the common palm civet? So as we know now, common species like the common palm civet have important roles in the ecosystem and can be important seed dispersal. So in one of our study led by Randolph Craig, uh, we placed camera traps on fruiting fishtail palms, where we have recorded five species of animals feeding on the fruits of the fishtail palm. And all of them are actually native common species. So other than the common palm civet, uh, we have also recorded the plantain squirrel, the oriental pipe hornbill, the long-tail macaque, and the pink neck green pigeon. So in an urban city like Singapore, we now find ourselves with the opportunity to habitat restoration with the help of these animals. And the knowledge of their diet can also be incorporated into uh, reforestation plans. So it has implications on forest regeneration and habitat management. So for example, by understanding the, uh, their diet, we can increase the attractiveness of the restoration site with uh, common food plant species that we know potential seed dispersers would feed on. Uh, we can also uh, identify and prioritize plant species that would require management intervention. So for example, uh, if we know that uh, the, the dispersal of this plant species is no longer uh, around, then, then that might require um, management intervention such as planting. And so um, this is also one of the strategies that the National Park Board in Singapore is adopting. So they are also including uh, uh, plants that are uh, fed on by civets and other seed dispersals, such as the fishtail palm, the tembusu, and even the critically endangered uh, sea shot nutmeg. Um, so these plants have been incorporated into their framework species for planting. And also um, another implication is that um, it is really important to connect uh, forest fragments to increase seed dispersal abilities because uh, barriers can limit the effectiveness of these uh, services. Um, so on the left, you can see um, that's the picture of the EcoLink at BKE, uh, which is an ecological bridge that was built to reconnect the two forest fragments, which is the Central Catchment Nature Reserve and the Bukitima Nature Reserve. Uh, which was separated by the Bukit Timah Expressway. So guess what? Um, one of the first animals to use the bridge was the civet. And how do we know that? It's because uh, we had a sighting of the civet poop on the bridge. Um, but of course, more can be done, uh, especially with the increasing uh, pressure uh, of development in Singapore. So it is really important to protect, uh, restore our forests, and also further enhance uh, ecological uh, connectivity and resilience for uh, biodiversity conservation. And so um, another implication 
of understanding uh, the diet ecology of the common palm civet is that uh, it also has uh, implications for wildlife management strategies. So one of them is the rehabilitation of uh, captive raised civets for release. Um, so back in 2015, we had an opportunity to have a first collaborative effort to attempt to rehabilitate um, a captive raised civet for release. Um, so this was a unique case uh, because the baby civet was a newborn and when it was found uh, by a staff from National Parks Board, uh, uh, there was no apparent contact with any adult civets. And therefore, this individual was um, brought to Wildlife Reserve Singapore, where it was uh, hand-reared and raised in captivity. Um, and so uh, we conducted a six-month study where we gradually introduced uh, plants, wild fruits and prey items to the civet over a period of six months. So this is with the knowledge of what uh, wild common palm civets are feeding in the wild. And so then we prepared for the release of the animal when we observed that the, the civet was feeding readily on the wild fruits. So what we did was that we uh, attached a GPS collar to the animal so that we could monitor the movement and the fate of the animal uh, post-release. Uh, we conducted an overnight survey on the release day to follow and observe the civet. Um, so what was the fate of the animal? Um, unfortunately, the collar dropped off early after nine days and we were not able to determine the fate of the release civet. However, what was more important was that uh, we learned from the behavior of the released animal that um, diet rehabilitation, enrichment, and habitat familiarization um, is a very important component for the rehabilitation. Um, but we also realize that this rehabilitation process can be very manpower intensive and resource demanding. And as well as more research is required uh, in order to really understand uh, uh, the fit of these translocated animals. So, um, so, some, so another implication of this means that uh, if we do encounter a baby civet in future, uh, it would be best to contact uh, ACRES or NPARCS immediately to attempt to return the baby to the parent and also to avoid human contact where possible. Um, this is so that we can increase their chance of survival and so that uh, we do not have to have the animal go through the whole uh, long intensive uh, rehabilitation process. And so being a civet in an urban environment is really not easy. Um, they face threats every day. Um, and this also means that if we want to protect and conserve biodiversity, we need to understand what are the threats that they are facing. So some of the challenges uh, faced by an urban civet uh, include uh, trapping, and sometimes this trapping can cause fatal injuries. Um, civets are also could, civets could also be killed by vehicles when they have to cross uh, roads that are between uh, forested areas or nature reserve. So um, it will be great uh, and important to slow down when driving uh, near such uh, forest areas. Um, civets uh, were also known to be killed by household pets, uh, such as dogs. So uh, one way to help the civets is uh, by not leaving uh, pet food out in the open so that these do not attract the civets to come down to your garden uh, to feed on the pet food. And so um, what can we do and how can we help the common palm civets? So besides uh, research, uh, we also think that it's very important to communicate science by conducting outreach, uh, education, and engagement. Um, so we have been involving the community uh, and building capacity building for youth who are interested in biodiversity conservation uh, as part of uh, the NUS Tolly Cats. Um, so this includes uh, participating in the annual festival of biodiversity where we uh, share about civets and other biodiversity that we have in Singapore uh, to the general public. Um, another way that we have also been approaching the science communication is by equipping uh, educators with knowledge on biodiversity as well as uh, nature-based solutions uh, for their lesson planning. 
From research, uh, we also provide uh, online resources such as our Facebook page. Um, so uh, if you have any sightings of uh, common palm civets, uh, please feel free to share with us uh, on this Facebook page. Um, and if you have any questions or if there's any uh, civets that you have found in your uh, house and you may need uh, to have some uh, you have some inquiries, we, are, we will also be very happy to uh, help you. Um, yeah, and also uh, engagement with public. So um, we are also, we have also been conducting uh, outreach activities uh, such as uh, night walks and school talks to raise awareness of our uh, native biodiversity and the common palm civets. Um, we also contributed an article on the common palm civet in the last quarter of the NSS Nature Watch. So if you like to uh, learn more about the common palm civets, uh, you can also download a copy uh, from the NSS website. And yeah, so in Singapore, uh, in the urban city in Singapore, where you know there's an increase in encounter between human civets, uh, this means that we also require a more consolidated, consolidated uh, conflict management strategies. So we are also part of the Urban Wildlife Working Group, um, where it is a collaboration of multiple stakeholders for the conservation and management of low-profile native urban wildlife in Singapore. And we seek uh, solutions for wildlife conflict, rescue, rehabilitation, and release. And so one of the recent initiatives from the Urban Wildlife Working Group is um, our wild neighbors. So we do understand that sometimes it is not always easy to with, live with our wild neighbors. And so uh, this website uh, seeks to promote coexistence with wildlife in Singapore and to empower members of the public uh, with knowledge as well as to educate the public about ongoing rescue, rehabilitation, and release efforts. So if you go onto the website, uh, you can visit the Civet tab, and you will be able to find materials such as the advisory by ACRES, um, as well as uh, some Q&A on what you can do if you see a civet in your house or in the neighborhood. And if you would like to find out more about the working group and the details of the rescue work, uh, you can also uh, visit the website and watch uh, this webinar. And lastly, um, you can also make a difference. So what the first is um, learn more about our flora and fauna. I think uh, there are many opportunities that you can learn more about flora and fauna, just like how you are here on a Saturday afternoon, uh, learning more about civets. Um, you can also visit the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum, or if you like plants and you like to learn more about seeds, uh, you can visit the Singapore Botanic Garden Seed Bank. Um, if you can draw, uh, please uh, share your uh, talents with us. Uh, we would really love uh, amazing artwork from people so that uh, we can use these uh, drawings uh, for the purpose of outreach purposes. And also you can help by not buying Kopi Lua, which is also known as the world's most expensive coffee, or I would like to think is the world's most cruel coffee. Um, so you please do spread the word uh, not to buy Kopi Lua and not to try them. And of course, um, I think it would be great if you could be involved uh, in the conservation uh, and other activities. So for example, you could join the NUS Tolicats in ecosystem restoration, uh, where you can help in uh, soil prep and also uh, restoration projects. And of course, there are many other uh, avenues to learn more about uh, our wildlife and also habitats that the civets live in. So uh, for example, uh, the upcoming Pesta Ubin, uh, you could uh, take a look at what are the activities that would be available, as well as I think there's an upcoming uh, walk at uh, Pula Ubin, which is also hosted by the Nature Society. And lastly, um, yeah, if you have seen any civets uh, around your neighborhood, uh, please do share your sighting with us. Uh, and um, these sightings are actually very important because um, it helps us to have a better understanding of the distribution of the mammals in Singapore, um, not restricted to the civets, um, and also allow us to have a glimpse of how these wildlife are living in our urban landscapes. 
And so um, it's truly amazing that we still have a wild urban native carnivoran living among us in Singapore. And every little effort matters. And we can all make a difference to our wildlife as we work towards co-living with these animals. And so with that, um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Zekwan. Um, okay, basically we have some questions here. Uh, you can continue to type your questions and we'll take them as they come in. Okay, the first question is uh, about the civet population. For the common palm civet, what is the population size in Singapore and perhaps Pula Ubin? And then what are their predators? Yeah. Mm. Okay, myself and sorry, myself and uh, Ding Li will be co-hosting this talk. So Ding Li will also help to moderate the questions. Okay. Yeah. So we do not have an actual like exact number of the population size of the common palm civets. Um, this is because in order to have the number, we would require another uh, scientific method to to <coughs> to to actually have an estimate of this number. So this would require uh, methods, for example, like distance sampling or conducting census. Uh, but so far we have not done that. So we do not have the actual number, uh, but we know that they are relatively uh, common. So we would estimate, so they have been estimated according to the, the Singapore Red Data Book, then they would be estimated at uh, about at least 500 to 1,000. For mainland Singapore only, or uh, in the, including Pulau Ubin? Uh, whole of Singapore. Whole of Singapore, okay. Yeah. So for the predators, um, natural predators of the common palm civet uh, would be the, one of them would be the reticulated python. So, um, so there's a story of my, the one of the civets that I, I collared and I was tracking tracking in Pulau Ubin. So, um, so for, for the GPS telemetry, there will be a signal that comes from the caller where I would receive on my receiver. So from the signal, I could tell that the civet has not been moving for the past 24 hours. And so when I track to the animal, I could only find a ball of fur and the collar. Okay. Okay. So the, the so so my my the civet that I was tracking was actually uh, predated on and the collar has been re regurgitated up. Oh okay. Yeah. That was from a python, is it? Um. So that so from an educate. So we tried to use DNA. Uh. Okay. To 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 determine the 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 identity of the predator. Uh. But we were not able to get any results. Uh. But from an educated guess. Uh. We would think that it was a python. I see. I think, but I think the, the pythons regurgitate uh, things that they cannot digest. This bit of fur, is it? Uh, of fur. So it's an entire ball of fur oh. that, that, that you know, encompasses the, the GPS collar. I see, I yeah, see. Cool. I think some of the large owls could eat civets as well, the large owls. We have, um, we have two huge owls in Singapore. In yes. Philippine, um, I think 5% of the Philippine eagle diet is common palm civet. Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, some species of hawks uh, were also mm. uh, observed to predate on the juvenile civets. Mm. Mm. Yeah, like the changeable hawk eagle. Yeah, I think it's possible. I think well, I mean just by extrapolation, um, changeable hawk eagle tried to take a long, a long tail macaque. So I think, mm. um, size wise, it's in the right category. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a uh, some. Another question coming up. So, Gloria, shall we take turns to yeah, yeah, yeah. Question? You can ask the next question. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, the next question come from uh, Jin Dat, uh, Jin, um, and he has uh, I think he has more than one question. If I'm not wrong, his first question is whether if there's any advice for how you put camera traps um, to 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 monitor civets. Uh, any any good price models for such use? So, <laughs> some technical advice for Chintan. I think he might want to do something in Dover or something like that. Yeah, I think he's got a second question down there. So I'm just going to throw it for your for your consideration as well. The second question is: What is the importance of forest fragments in the urban environment as civet habitat? And if those were lost, how would it affect the civets? Mm. What's your take on this? Um, so I think the first question is on camera trap models, mm, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the camera trap model I use uh, is Reconyx. Uh, it's it's uh, one of the most uh, credible um, 
brand, I would say. Um, it is also expensive. Um, when I was using it, uh, it they could only take pictures, but now they could even uh, take videos. Um, I think another uh, model that I've used uh, is Bushnell. So in terms of the price range, it's uh, slightly lower, but it's still uh, as it, it works fine for me as well. So um, you can uh, see which which one because uh, it depends whether you would like a photograph uh, or videos. Because videos for videos, it will be good for uh, capturing uh, behavior. Mm. Yeah, but it also takes much longer to sort through <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, the videos. Yeah. Uh, um, both uh, Raconix and Bushnell, uh, both can detect uh, heat detection as well as uh, motion sensors, or it's just motion sensor? Uh, both. Yeah. Okay. So actually, there's really a wide range of models and um, and prices, so 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 it really uh is really uh, up to you to decide what what is most suited for your um purpose lah. Okay, so Reconix, this you can see that the brand over here is at the bottom of this thank you slide, <laughs> uh, bottom right corner. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um. So the second question that uh, Dingli was asking about secondary forest. Yeah, I think I think there was a I think Jinta was interested to to get your thoughts on how important you think are these urban woodland slash forest patches for civet cats. You know, I mean, there's lots of little patches of woodland across Singapore. Um, are, are they how important are these woodlands? And if if you clear them, what is the long term impact on civet populations? Mm. So, um, uh, so I think even for the urban civets that we have in Singapore, uh, where we have observed them to use the urban matrix, but I think predominantly they are actually need the surrounding urban, uh, the surrounding forest fragments. So, for example, even like um, uh, in Siklap or Potsdam, there are actually many pockets of uh, green spaces that the civets are actually using. And the urban matrix could just be part of their home range that they are utilizing because there's uh, easily accessible fruits such as the rambutan and the banana. So I would think that the, the, the nearby forest fragments are still the most important for our wildlife because that's where they would most probably be the areas that they retreat back. Mm. Yeah, so and it's not only for the civets because um, you know, based on like biodiversity surveys, uh, we also know that uh, civets are not. I mean, civets is just one of the species that are using the, the the forest fragments, and mm. especially in Singapore where we are highly developed and urbanized, so all these, uh, small pockets of green spaces become increasingly important, and so, um, we also should not look at them uh, in isolated patches. We need to, it's increasingly important that we, there, there's actually uh, interventions or measures to actually connect these green spaces together. Okay. So moving on, <clears throat> thanks for the answer. Moving on, right, uh, how much parental care do baby civets receive? Like, like, for example, how many months or years? And do both parents help out? Um, based from based on our camera trapping studies, uh, we usually see the juvenile with uh, one parent civet, and that's the female. So, so we do not see like males and females together, except for maybe one sighting of them of the female and the male mating, but with the juvenile, then is uh, with the female. So, what kind of parental care uh, do this the babies receive? What kind of parental care? So sometimes we uh, do see uh, the so when when the when the baby is like newborn or like they were too young to before they could venture out, we have sometimes observed them to be hiding in like birth net birth bird nest ferns uh, okay. in rain trees uh, in the urban areas, and then uh, so. But when they are about the age where they could venture out, like for example, like this, uh, this camera trap photo, right? They are already able to move around on their own, and they are like following their their mom around. Yeah. So that means.
Gloria, I think. Means, yeah. uh, between, uh, that means maybe they take one whole year before they are weaned off the parents, or how long is it? Oh, um, we do not know the actual months, but it will probably be two, two three months. Oh, that's quite fast. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dingding, you want to take the next question? Yep, sounds good. Yeah. Um, all right, so that, here's a question, I think, on um, making environments more uh, friendly for civets. Uh, from, this is a question from Po Tun Xuan. Uh, the question here is, how can urban development, like um, you know, buildings, residential and offices, roads, parks, how can we, how can we design, structure, configure, plan things to make the urban environment uh, more friendly for civic civets. What's your take on that? Mm. I think uh, if you would like civets in your neighborhood or in in the urban area, I think is uh, for the planting. Uh, it will be great to, of course, um, have small uh, uh, to keep existing forest patches in the area. So mm. do not remove those forest patches. Consider uh, it's important to keep existing forest patches before mm. the development. Uh, but if in case where there, in the cases where it's already developed and you want to um, do habitat uh, restoration or you want uh, to make the, the environment more conducive for animals to visit, then uh, you could uh, do tiered planting. So it's by planting not only the trees, but also shrubs so that it kind of mimics the, the, the forest structure. Um, and also uh, food sources. So you can consider uh, planting some of the, the, the food plants that mm. civets are known to feed on. So, uh, and also selection of the food plants. So for example, like uh, as we have learned from the sharing just now, uh, you could, consider native uh, plant species such as tembusu, uh, the fishtail palm, the tempera mulinana. Yeah, so I think there are many different ways to do that. And also civets are adaptable. So if we are only talking about civets, actually even like they could use like um, structures like power lines as connectors. So um, of course in, in for a more natural, uh, kind of a uh, way it could be like a road bridge. So if you if you would like to encourage the movement of arboreal animals, so not only civets, but so if you mm. would like to encourage uh, uh, say planting squirrels or other um, animals to use mm. the area, then providing connectivity, food resources, and also habitats for roosting. Mm. So, uh, following on to that, right? Um, for second, let's say if they're in secondary forest, where do they hide out in the daytime? Sorry? Where do they uh, sleep in the daytime? In the secondary forest. Um, so uh, based on my tracking studies, um, I so with the GPS, GPS collar, I could track the animals to their day bed. So the day bed is where they sleep in the day. So they, they would sleep, they will find trees with uh, dense, vines and climbers to conceal themselves. So basically they, they you, so, so uh, when I track to the exact tree, I actually can't see the animal because it's so well hidden amongst the vegetation. Okay, so do they, are any civets found in purely urban areas where there are no uh, uh, adjacent secondary forests? Mm. Okay, hear me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could hear you. Yes. That means uh, there's no secondary forest at all, purely urban areas, but there are fruit trees and all that to feed them. Are there such a civet, such a civet population in Singapore? Mm, not that I know of. I, I think most of the civet sightings in urban areas, for example, like Potsdam is next to the rail corridor. Okay. Um, so there's actually connectivity and uh, pockets of green space where they could visit. Um, in even in NUS, which is very built up, uh, because yeah, it's next to the ridge, right? So yes. so the civets are also able to use the southern ridges. Hmm. Uh, at NTU, um, it's next to near the western catchment. So, um, yeah. 
So we have seen, uh, have a sighting of uh, civet at uh, Bishan Amokyo Park. So okay. that's still next to the forest. Yeah. So, area. yeah. so I would say it's important that there's adjacent <laughs> forest patches. Okay. Okay. Dingli, how about you? Your question, please. There are two questions about reporting sightings. Um, I think it's coming from KC. So I think KC is um, interested to know whether if there's any website portal for, for, for people to put in their sightings or should, should, should they use iNaturalist? Um, what's, what's your recommendation for KC if he or she wants to submit um, observations? Oh, so um, for observations, um, you could submit to iNaturalist. That would be a more um, like a standardized platform. Uh, we also have a separate link, which is the which is this uh, website. I think can can you see the yeah. which is the memo dot So okay. this is a, a, a ongoing uh, long term. Uh, setting records of mammals in Singapore that we have been mm -hmm. collecting. So this is more for uh, uh, NUS research related. But then of course the iNaturalist would be a more um, standardized and you know, yeah, so. Okay, so, so there's a follow-up question. Uh, when you want to, for the, all these citing reports, right? What are the usual uh, things that people should take note of? Like, uh, do they need photos or whatever? Uh, it would be best if you have photos, uh, because if you have photo, then basically we there's also the the date and time, right? That uh, but of course we would like uh, so uh, the photo could also help in the confirmation of the identity of the animals. So identity of the animal, date, time, location, and then if possible, uh, some notes on the behavior. So for example, if in urban space, then uh, whether are they feeding on any of the food, fruit, fruits in your garden or um, uh, was it with a juvenile or you know, was it using uh, the roof space. So I think all this information uh, would provide us with a deeper insight on how they are using the urban space. Okay. Yeah. Dingli, do you have to go off already? Or I'm so, I, guess, I think we can take one more question. Okay, um, can. Let me see. I think we seem to have covered most of the questions. Okay, I, I have a question of my own. <laughs> okay, to go find for it. Or follow up with what you said. Like, why do they smell like pandas? <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, it's a very curious thing. Yeah, so so for civets, right, they have uh these uh anal glands that help them to scent mark, but it's just coincidental that it smells like pandan. So so some people say that it smells like popcorn. So so it's just um how uh how you relate to the smell to what you are familiar with. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> how, how do you tell the gender? Just now you said that based on the face, you're able to tell male or female. I know genitalia is one, but how about the facial markings or something? Um, so that is from uh, that that that's that's size. that's that's a way that I I do it lah because uh okay. after after seeing many civil yeah, photos, so so for for males they 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 have like a more angled, uh, angular is it? Yeah, angular facial features, oh, which okay. makes them more like M masculine looking. Yes. Like <laughs> Okay. So female is softer features, is that what you're saying? Yes, the, the, the face is more slender. Well, the... okay. Is that how about uh, in terms of size? Uh, is one bigger than the other? Uh, size is not the most accurate way. Okay. But the males, the, 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 the bigger healthy males could be quite stocky. Okay. So males are slightly bigger, is that what you're saying? more well built mm, yeah okay 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 um okay any more question okay let me see i think there's one more question that just came in let me see there's a couple of comments there i think muslim cemetery next to pcn okay um okay maybe this question is about uh adjacent areas uh that they can retreat to uh, next to urban areas. So how about cemeteries, uh, like a Muslim cemetery next to a PCN, would that help uh, in 
in terms of keeping it wild and all that. To, so that cigarettes have somewhere to go to in the daytime. Mm. As part of their range, uh, that's right. Yeah, I think as long as the the environment is has has wild greeneries, like has greeneries, trees, uh, dense vegetation, then that then that would be a potential site that the civet is able to utilize. Okay. So you're saying that within one night they they have been known to wander as far as 1.3 kilometers. Uh, uh no, that is the the estimated seed dispersal distance. Oh, so 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 that is based on the the gut passage time. Okay. So so uh the fastest time that the seed can pass through the gut passage for fishtail palm that I've recorded is one hour. Oh, but then fine. some of the seeds could also retain in the gut for up to uh, more than 24 hours. So based on the findings, uh, I estimated that uh, within this time of the gut passage and uh, looking into the movement pattern mm. uh, within this time, I estimated uh, that to be 1.3 kilometers. But that's not how far the animal is able to move within a day. So mm -hmm. actually in uh, the forest environments, uh, they, they do not only have one day bit. So they actually move from one side to another side. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes in urban areas, you might um, have a sighting of a civet, but you do not see it every day. Mm -hmm. But it might come, it, you might have another civet or because we, we do not know whether it's the same silver, right? Unless we uh, tag it or color it. But you do not, sometimes you do not see them every day because they are they have a home range that they move around within. Uh, and so they might stay in point A on the first day. And then when they wake up, they'll move to point B where they will forage and then they will rest. And after that, the next day they will move, might move to point C or they might move back to point A. Okay. Yeah. So how, how big will you, will you say that their home range is in terms of maybe football field size? Uh, I think uh, about, was it uh, 20 hectares? So that's roughly 20 football fields, right? Yeah, so it depends. So males uh, from my study uh, found that males have larger home range than females. Mm -hmm. And then uh, within the home range of one of the males, uh, there were actually three females, uh, the home range of three females that overlap with that one male. Oh, that's interesting. A bit like the tigers or so, they all have this kind of pattern. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So can, can I find out more about hunting behavior? Um, do they specifically hunt for birds and insects or do they like more of an opportunistic thing that is next to them and then they, when they are feeding on the fruits, then they uh, eat some of the protein that they come across? Is it active or passive hunting in a sense? Um, it's active hunting. So for birds, uh, we find uh, they, they, they feed on the... So we find feathers and bones. And they are also known to uh, feed on eggs, bird eggs. Mm -hmm. um, and then for insects, uh, so for the grass, hopper, and the crickets, they are actually the main uh, uh, insects that they feed on. They also feed on other insects such as the forest cockroaches, uh, beetles, and for the non-insect invertebrates, uh, I've also found them to feed on centipedes. Um, and uh, based on the collaboration with uh, Ming Kai, who is a, a autopteran uh, taxonomist, uh, we found that they actually, uh, based on the different species of uh, grasshoppers and crickets that we found uh, in the skets, uh, they it seems like the civets are going for the ground dwelling and the larger species. So the civets, it means that the civets actually come down to the ground to hunt for these uh, crickets. Okay. So that means it's a pound, they pounce on it or uh, do you know how they hunt it actually? Um, I've not seen them hunting a cricket, but okay. uh, yeah, I would imagine they will have to uh, sneak up and hunt, okay. pounce on it. Can. Okay, I think Dingli has to leave. Um, okay, I'll just ask one last question. Um, okay, someone is asking, uh, has there been any studies using ultrasound devices to uh, prevent civets from traveling on roofs? Um, not that we know of. Okay. Yeah. So uh, to prevent civets from traveling on roof or to you not use the roof space, usually we will recommend that you uh, it would be best to block off the, the entrance to the roof space. 
Yeah, because then then it. It's a physical barrier, rather yes, than yes, physical, sound. physical barrier. Okay, okay, can, okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Sukran, for giving this talk. Yeah, it's been most enlightening. Yeah. Thank you, and Gloria, and we have also received a whole lot of thank you, uh, thank you notes in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>